Good day. A few days ago, I did a video about the f frenetic diplomatic uh, exchanges and discussions which are taking place centred on Moscow um, as the Taliban gradually edges ever closer to the Afghan capital, Kabul. Um, the Taliban, incidentally, now claim that they are in control of 85% of Afghan territory. That may be an exaggeration. So far, they have not captured any of Afghanistan's provincial capitals, but that may be from choice. They say it is from choice. They say it is so as not to complicate the US withdrawal from the country. The Russians, for their part, say that the Taliban are in control of two-thirds of Afghanistan's border with Tajikistan, the Central Asian Republic, which was formerly a part of the Soviet Union and which is allied to Russia and which has recently called on Russia for help to protect its border in light of the fighting that is going on within Afghanistan. So the indications are that the, Af that the Taliban are indeed continuing to advance and are advancing rapidly with more and more reports of Afghan army troops giving up the fight, uh, handing their weapons in, and indeed of the Taliban gaining possession of vast stocks of US equipment left over by the US military or abandoned by the US's Afghan allies. Anyway, the diplomatic discussions that I talked about, the frenetic diplomacy continues, and Moscow has now hosted the most important delegation of all with negotiations going on in Moscow, as I am speaking, between the Russians and a delegation from the Taliban itself. And the Russian foreign ministry has published a very interesting readout of the discussions and of the agreements, tacit agreements, which the Russians and the Taliban have reached with each other. Before I discuss this readout, I would make a few quick observations. Firstly, uh, the Russians and the Taliban have actually been in contact with each other for a very long time now. They actually began... Uh, uh, talks or, or at least contacts several years ago at a time before the United States was in contact with the Taliban, at a time in fact when Barack Obama was still US president. I remember that the US was extremely annoyed by these Russian contacts with the Taliban and criticised them strongly, though the Russians persisted with them. I've always felt, by the way, that that strange and phony story we heard last year about the Russians offering the Taliban bounties for every American soldier they killed was partly an echo of that American annoyance about Russia's contacts with the Taliban, which clearly persists still to this day, despite the fact that the United States has itself been negotiating with the Taliban in Doha for some time now. Anyway, the Russian contacts with the Taliban and the Russian decision to host a Taliban delegation in Moscow is, however, particularly remarkable given one curious fact, which is that in Russia itself, the Taliban is considered, or in legally speaking, to be a terrorist organisation and is actually outlawed there. One wonders for how much longer that will continue. Anyway, the Taliban delegation has been received in Moscow and it is clear that the decision by the Russians to receive this delegation was one which was decided upon and agreed at the very highest levels of the Russian government, including by President Putin himself. And in fact, we have confirmation of this from no less a person 
than Putin's own spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, who at a press conference on Friday said the, said the following. Of course, Vladimir Putin is aware of this. These contacts are necessary, considering the tense situation in Afghanistan and the development of the situation on the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. These talks with the Taliban are necessary. Um, interestingly enough, uh, it seems that Peskov refused to answer a question as to whether or not Russia would actually recognise the Taliban as the government of Afghanistan if the Taliban takes over the entire country, as it is now increasingly likely to do. And in fact, we also learn from no less a person than Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov that the Russians have no intention of interfering directly in events in Afghanistan. They're not, certainly not going to send troops there and they're going to do nothing to impede the Taliban's advances, provided the Taliban restricts itself to Afghan territory. And Lavrov said this very explicitly in a press conference he held in Moscow directly after uh, talks he held with the Indian Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jai Shankar, Jai Shankar, who visited Moscow, in part at least, to discuss the situation in Afghanistan. These, by the way, are uh, Lavrov's words. As for the continued military apps, uh, action in Afghanistan, in the absence of the political process, the events on Af Afghan territory concerns us exclusively from the point of view of a possible spillover of troubles onto the territory of our allies. The fact that the Talibs have occupied border posts on the border with Iran, on the border with Tajikistan, whilst this is happening on Afghanistan's territory, we are not going to undertake any measures except for our insistent calls for the political process which all Afghans have said they support, to happen as soon as possible. In other words, what Lavrov is saying is that provided the Taliban restrict themselves to Afghan territory, the Russians will take no action. They will not interfere in the Taliban's advances in Afghanistan itself, except diplomatically by trying to facilitate this political settlement of the conflict, which is what I'm now going to come to. Because that, it is clear, was the primary topic, or one of the primary topics, of the discussions that took place in Moscow between the Russians and the Taliban. And I'm now going to read out in full the relatively brief readout from the Russian Foreign Ministry that has taken place following those discussions. On July 8th, Special Press Presidential Representative for Afghanistan, Zamir Kabulov, held consultations in Moscow with a delegation from the Taliban's political office. The discussion focused on the situation in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the prospects for starting intra-Afghan talks. The Russian side voiced their concern over the mounting tensions in the northern regions of Afghanistan and urged the Taliban not to allow these tensions to spread outside the country. The Taliban delegation reassured the Russian side that the Taliban would not violate the borders of the Central Asian countries and also provided guarantees of the safety of foreign countries' diplomatic and consular missions in Afghanistan. The representatives of the Taliban reaffirmed their interest in securing a lasting peace in their country through negotiations, taking into account the interests of all ethnic groups living in the country, as well as their readiness to observe human rights, including the rights of women, in keeping with Islamic standards and Afghan traditions. 
It was separately emphasised that the Taliban is firmly determined to ward off the threat of ISIS in Afghanistan and eradicate drug production in the country after the end of the civil war. Now, that is an extremely interesting readout, fairly short, but it actually contains within itself a huge amount of information. Now, let us, first of all, start at the question of the border and of the uh, threat to the Central Asian states. And we read the following. The Russian side voiced their concern over the mounting tensions in the northern regions of Afghanistan and urged the Taliban not to allow these tensions to spread outside the country. The Taliban delegation reassured the Russian side that the Taliban would not violate the borders of the Central Asian countries. So that's a straightforward quid pro quo. The Taliban say that they will not take any action that will violate the borders of Afghanistan or which will threaten Russia's Central Asian allies that form part of its Central Asian sphere of influence. So as I recently discussed, the leaders of the Central Asian states, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and by the way also Turkmenistan, have all been in touch with Moscow about the situation in Afghanistan. The Russians have pledged to protect and defend them in the event that there is any threat to them from uh, um, Afghanistan, from the Taliban in Afghanistan. And the Taliban have now given the Russians a categorical assurance that there will be no such threat that the Taliban will not cross the border, that they will not attack or disrupt the Central Asian states, and that there is no danger of this, and that that is not the Taliban's intention at all. The Taliban will pursue victory in Afghanistan for themselves. They will seek to set up an Islamic emirate in Afghanistan, but they will not export that ideology or that political system to other countries, they will not export it to former Soviet Central Asia. And in return, the Russians will not do, take any step that would impede in any way on the Taliban's achievement of victory within Afghanistan. So that is very clear. That's a clear pledge that the Taliban have given to the Russians and in, the Rus in return, the Russians have said that they will not interfere. And we read further from this readout that the Taliban have also provided guarantees of the safety of foreign countries' diplomatic and consular missions in Afghanistan. Now, that essentially confirms that the Russians intend to maintain an embassy in in Kabul, which also means that if the Taliban do take over, the Russians will indeed recognise the Taliban as the government of the country. But the important point about the safety of foreign embassies and consular missions in Afghanistan is that the there has been some talk recently of uh, Turkey, of uh, President Erdogan of Turkey, redeploying Turkish troops, which are already in Afghanistan as part of the NATO mission, which is now being wound, wound down, are redeploying those Turkish troops to protect the uh, a Kabul airport and to protect the diplomatic and consular missions in Afghanistan. Now, the Taliban have said that if that happens... They will treat those Turkish troops as occupiers, in which case they could find themselves a target for Taliban attack. The Russians, for their part, do not want to see Turkish troops in Afghanistan. They are already annoyed by the way in which the Turks have inserted themselves 
into the conflicts in the Caucasus, in Libya, in Syria, and the way in which the Turks are now trying to expand their influence into Central Asia. So they do not want to see Turkish troops in Afghanistan, and they are are at one with the Taliban on this. So after this statement, the Russians will be able to tell the Turks, your troops are not needed in Kabul. The Taliban have said that they will ensure the safety of foreign diplomatic and consular missions in Afghanistan and, by extension, Kabul airport also. So no need for Turkish troops in Kabul. They should leave. They should leave in their own interests because otherwise they will become targets of the Taliban and they're not needed anyway. So uh, I suspect that Erdogan's attempts to establish himself as a player in Afghanistan will shortly come to an end also. So that's another important point where the Russians and the Afghans are clearly in agreement. But then we come to the real heart of this readout and to the real heart of the discussions between the Russians and the Taliban. Note, first of all, the words in the first paragraph. The discussion focused on the situation in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the prospects for starting intra-Afghan talks. And then we read, we read further down in the readout. The representatives of the Taliban reaffirmed their interest in securing a lasting peace in their country through negotiations, taking into account the interests of all ethnic groups living in the country, as well as their readiness to observe human rights, including the rights of women, in keeping with Islamic traditions and Islamic standards and Afghan standards. So, the Russians want talks between the Taliban and other parties. But which other parties? Well, the clue is contained in these words. Secure a lasting peace in their country through negotiations, taking into account the interests of all ethnic groups. Now, the problem with the Taliban back in the 1990s was that it was a militant, sectarian, Pushtu-based group which had considerable support in the Pushtu areas in the south of Afghanistan, but which were deeply unpopular and indeed rejected among, amongst the ethnic groups, the Uzbeks and the Tajiks and the Hazara, in the north of the country, who uh, saw the push, uh, saw the Taliban, not just as a sectarian and fundamentalist organisation, deeply hostile to their own practices of Islam, but also as a Pushtu dominated group, set on imposing Pushtu dominance over the whole of Afghanistan. And this meant that after the Taliban took control of Afghanistan in 1994, there was no real peace in Afghanistan. The Taliban were never able to con gain control of the entire country. They, at their peak, only controlled around 85% of it. And there was always, and at all times, tension and fighting going on in some part of Afghanistan. And of course, this was part of the long running Afghan wars, which went back all the way to the 1970s, when there was a coup or a revolution, if you prefer, in Afghanistan in 1978, bringing to power a left wing communist oriented government, which led in turn to an insurgency in many parts of the Afghan countryside, which was supported by the United States as part of its grand strategy of embarrassing uh, 
and hurting the Soviet Union. Now, that war, that insurgency, spiralled into a war between the Soviet army and the Mujahideen, the Afghan resistance, the Mujahideen, and the Afghan government of that time. And after the Soviets withdrew in 1989, and after the government, which the Soviets backed, in turn collapsed in 1992, there was a prolonged and bitter civil war before the Taliban finally gained control in the mid-1990s. But as I said, Taliban control was never total and it was never accepted by all of the people or all of the groups and communities that make up Afghanistan because the Taliban was seen as fundamentalist and sectarian and also as an instrument of Pushtu dominance. Now, what the Russians want is a stable and peaceful Afghanistan, which is no longer a threat to its neighbours. And what they're telling the Taliban is that if the Taliban repeat the practices they followed in the 1990s, then peace and stability in Afghanistan will not be achieved because other ethnicities and communities like the Uzbeks and the Tajiks and the Hazara will reject them and the long Afghan wars will continue. And that is what those words are about securing a lasting peace through negotiations, taking into account the interests of all ethnic groups, as well as observing human rights, including the rights of women, in keeping with Islamic standards and Afghan traditions, is all about. What the Taliban are turning, telling the Russians is that they too want peace and stability in Afghanistan. They too want a government, a government which of course they will lead, which is in full control of the entire country. And they too understand that that can only be achieved through negotiations which take into account the interests of all ethnic groups living in the country and which will uh, observe human rights, including the rights of women, in keeping with Islamic standards and Afghan traditions. By the way, when we speak of human rights, it's essential to understand that we do not mean here human rights in the way that they might be understood by, say, the European Union. It means human rights in accordance, in keeping with, Islamic tradition, standards and Afghan traditions. That is to say, the kind of human rights which the communities in Afghanistan share. The Russians, for their part, have never been in the business of promoting human rights and engaging in democracy promotion around the world. That has never been their business. What they want is a government in Afghanistan in full control of the entire country, a stable, a stable uh, government in command of a peaceful country, which commands the, co the consent of all the people of Afghanistan, including all of its diverse communities, and which is, achieves that peace and stability by recognising and abiding by the Islamic tradition, Islamic standards and traditions shared by all of Afghanistan's people, including those which relate to the rights of women. So that's what this is all about. It's not about achieving a democracy of the sort that people talk about in the West with human rights of the kind that people talk about in the West. It is about a peaceful and stable Afghanistan of a sort that is recognised as a, a, a place which all the communities of the, of, that make up Afghanistan are content to live within.
And the reason why the Russians want a peaceful and stable Afghanistan is explained by the very last paragraph. It was separately emphasized that the Af Taliban is determined to ward off the threat of ISIS in Afghanistan and eradicate drug produ production in the country after the end of the civil war. Now, the point about all of this is that from a Russian point of view, it was Afghanistan's instability previously, the endless wars that took place there, the absence of a government in full control of the country, which had allowed or made possible the establishment of the violent and dangerous jihadi terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda uh, and now ISIS to establish themselves in the country. So the Russians want a peaceful, stable government, one which, as I said, has to include representatives of all the communities and which is accepted by all the communities in Afghanistan to allow no room or space for entities like Al-Qaeda and ISIS to establish th themselves there. And as we see, the Taliban agree. And the reason they agree is as follows. And note in particular the emphasis on ISIS. As far as the Taliban are concerned, ISIS is not an ideological partner or kindred spirit. It is a rival and a threat, and the same is true to a great extent of Al-Qaeda. Both Al-Qaeda and ISIS are Arab-led and Arab-dominated, and both seek to establish a worldwide Islamic caliphate led by themselves, led by Arabs. There is little place for ta the Taliban in this structure. And ISIS in particular, which now has established a presence in Afghanistan, is a rival and competitor of the Taliban for power in Afghanistan and therefore is un as unacceptable to the Taliban as it is to the Russians. What the Taliban want is an Islamic emirate in Afghanistan controlled by themselves. They do not want to be subordinated to some great caliphal structure led by ISIS or indeed by Al-Qaeda, and they certainly do not want to be challenged by ISIS, especially on their own territory. So when the Russians tell them that they want, tell the Taliban that they do not want to see ISIS establish itself in Afghanistan, they find a ready reception from the Taliban, which is why the Taliban are able to say, that they are firmly determined to ward off the threat of ISIS in Afghanistan, as is said in this readout. So on this issue, on the danger of ISIS and on the danger of Al-Qaeda, as on all the others discussed up to now, the Russians and the Taliban can make common cause. And, of course, there is the other issue, which is also discussed, which is the eradication of drug production. Now, as everyone knows, or at least most people know, Afghanistan is the centre today of the world heroin um, industry. And this is a major concern for the Russians, because one of the lines through which um, Afghan heroin passes to Europe is through Russia, and the result has been a major problem for the Russians in terms of heroin addiction within their own country. And that problem of heroin addiction, by the way, often leads to heroin addicts 
sharing needles, which partly explains why Russia also has an, a historic AIDS problem. So this is a problem that the Russians also have. And of course, the Taliban themselves have a history of being opposed to heroin production. Indeed, they tried to eradicate it in the 1990s and achieved some success in doing so. And one senses that here again, the Russians might have a receptive uh, um, 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 perspective on the part of the Taliban. The Taliban might be willing to agree with the Russians to achieve that. I'm going to guess, however, that ending drug production in, Taliban, in Afghanistan would be a far greater challenge for the Taliban than eradicating ISIS would ever be. We will see whether these prom promises the Taliban give about drug production will actually be fulfilled or are indeed achievable. But that is for another day. Anyway, how is this going to be established? How are we going to see this peaceful uh, Afghanistan establish itself, one in which the Taliban either broadens its own movement or agrees to share power or at least establishes a government which, through negotiations, this is what the readout says, takes into account the interests of all the ex ethnic groups and uh, observes human rights in keeping with Islamic standards and Afghan traditions. How is that going to be done? Well, the answer is contained in the first paragraph of this readout through intra-Afghan talks. And the purpose, one of the purposes of this visit, of this Afghan delegation to Moscow, is to set up these intra-Afghan talks, with the Russians acting, if not perhaps exactly as mediators, at least in some form as brokers. And the Russians would be in a good position to do that. They, after all, know Afghanistan very well. Not only did they fight a war there in the 1980s, but they were the principal investor and aid contributor to the country going back all the way to the 1950s. So they know Afghanistan extremely well. They're extremely well informed about the country. And they also have very good relations with many of the leaders of these communities, like the Hazara, the Tajiks, and the Uzbeks, who are located mainly in the north and center of Afghanistan, and who, by the way, also backed the left-wing government that the Russians were backing during the wars of the 1980s. So the Russians, in a sense, are in a good position to act as honest brokers. So, to some extent, are the Iranians. And it's interesting that before this Af Taliban delegation arrived in Moscow for the talks there, they also passed through Tehran, where they will have had similar talks with the Iranians. The Iranians, in particular, are known to have great influence with the Hazara and Tajik people, who are um, culturally very close to Iran. So, negotiations. And negotiations in order to establish a peaceful and stable Afghanistan, bringing peace to this country, to Afghanistan, a peace and stability it has not known since the 1970s and bringing the, the long Afghan wars finally to an end. Why would the Taliban agree? Well, the short answer is, I am sure, because they know perfectly well that if they don't agree, if they do establish, try and establish the same kind of Pushtu, fundamentalist, sectarian state that they tried to establish in the 1990s, there will not be peace and stability in Afghanistan. The Taliban must be weary of war also by now.
I suspect that amongst many of them, these calls for a peaceful, stable, though independent Afghanistan, must also be falling upon receptive ears. The Taliban obviously want to be back in control of the country. Obviously, they deeply resent the way they were ousted by the United States back in the early 2000s. Obviously, they want to establish an Islamic emirate in Afghanistan, as they did in the 1990s. But also, they want peace and stability so that they can consolidate their, uh, uh, their government in a way that they failed to do in the 1990s, so that they can ward off challenges from groups like ISIS, which, as I said, they see as competitors, and so that they can finally achieve that which all Afghans must to some extent want now, which is a degree of peace. Now, can this be done? Well, as I said, the Russians are probably in a very good position to act as brokers. But there is a problem, which is the current government in Kabul. Now, that government has up to now consistently resisted any form of power sharing with the Taliban and has always opposed negotiations with the Taliban towards establishing a, a broad-based government which would be which would ultimately replace them and it is actually quite well known that the russians are becoming increasingly exasperated with this government's refusal to as the russians would put it face reality i suspect however that as the taliban gradually closes in on kabul um even the current government in Afghanistan, the government of President Ghani, will gradually have to face the reality that it is that its position without American support is becoming unsustainable. And given the way in which the United States has left effectively abandoning the country to its fate, I strongly suspect that as they also try and find or look for a dignified exit, they will turn to the Russians. So my guess is that sometime, perhaps in late June or in early August, we will start to see serious negotiations, possibly brokered by the Russians, probably in collaboration, as the Russians always like to do, with other powers like Pakistan and um, Iran and possibly India, negotiations for a peaceful transfer of power from the present government of Afghanistan to a new government led by the Taliban, but rather more broad-based and including representatives from various communities other communities um, in Afghanistan, like the Tajiks, the Hazara and the Uzbeks. I would say, by the way, that the, ta that the Taliban itself seems to be trying to reach out to these communities, uh, something which, incidentally, it entirely did not do in the 1990s. It seems that Tajik uh, 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 chiefs, have now been given important command positions within the Taliban itself. And it's notable that in many of the areas, especially those along the Tajik border, where the Taliban have recently been making the fastest advances, um, that most of these areas are actually Tajik, and the Tajik people seem to be accepting the Taliban advances into these territories in the under, with the understanding that the, uh, uh, that the Taliban will not carry out the kind of repressions and other things that were such a feature of their previous period of rule in the 1990s. So it's possible 
that these negotiations, which I expect to start in earnest sometime towards the end of July and the beginning of August, will finally crystallise and take shape. And instead of the storming of Kabul that many people fear, what we could perhaps see is an orderly transfer of power from the existing government to a Taliban-led government, which will be restructured in some way to take into account the various communities of Afghanistan with a view to establishing for the first time since the 1970s a government which is in peaceful and complete control of the entire country. Now, it doesn't just end there, of course. I said some of the things the Russians want to achieve, that they want to achieve a peaceful and stable government which will not be a threat to themselves or a threat to the various states of Central Asia that formed the former Soviet, that were part of the former Soviet Union. And I've also said that the Russians certainly do not want to see um, groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS re-establish themselves in Afghanistan. And that's another reason why they want a strong and stable government in full control of the country. And it's also uh, uh, the Russian desire to see an end to drug production in Afghanistan, a much more difficult thing to achieve, but one which the Taliban also appear to want and which also requires a strong, peaceful and stable government in a peaceful country to be established in Afghanistan. But there is something else, and that is the greater geostrategic picture. Now, on the 13th and 14th of July, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is due to have a meeting in Dushanbe in Tajikistan, one of these uh, um, Central Asian states that were once part of the Soviet Union and which are now allied to Russia and which form part of Russia's sphere of influence, which Afghanistan borders upon. And it's important to say that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization though less than an alliance, is nonetheless a real organisation with a, a, a political aspect, and it is one which includes the two key Eurasian allies, China and Russia. In other words, it is one of the essential building blocks, one of the essential institutions along with the One Belt, One Road initiative that the Chinese have, um, the uh, Eurasian Economic Community, which the Russians have launched, and the Collective Security Organization, tr uh, Treaty Organization, which is the uh, military alliance the Russians have established. It is one of these core cent Eurasian institutions which together are forging this structure which the Russians are increasingly referring to as Greater Eurasia. And two countries which are not so far members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization are due to attend this summit meeting in Dushanbe on the 13th and 14th of July, both of, which, both of these countries being aspirants to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. These two countries are Iran and Afghanistan, with Afghanistan being represented by Foreign Minister Hanif Atmar. Um, 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 the Foreign Minister, I should stress, of the existing Afghan government. Now, it is very much in Russian, and I would add Chinese in, in, in uh, interests for Afghanistan eventually to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization because Afghanistan is a key component part of Greater Eurasia, the Greater Eurasia that the Russians talk about, but which the Chinese are also keen to build. One of the reasons why the American neocons were so interested in Afghanistan, 
is because the neocons understand that without Afghanistan, the greater Eurasia project is rendered far more difficult. And the, the neocons wanted to use Afghanistan as a vehicle to expand US influence into Central Asia, dis disrupting the construction of the Greater Eurasia Project. So by bringing Afghanistan into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Russians, and by the way, also the Chinese, would be taking a first step towards integrating Afghanistan into this project to build a greater Eurasia, which is for them a matter of geopolitical um, significance as they try to build up greater Eurasia into this power block to rival the United States and the West, the Western alliance, which for the Russians and the Chinese is now their major geopolitical rival. So the Russians will want to make sure that whatever government in Afghanistan replaces the existing government continues with this project of greater Eurasian construction and abides by with what, whatever commitments Hanif Atmar makes at the summit meeting in Dushanbe for Afghanistan to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And I think it is likely that the Taliban this time will also be favourable to that idea too. Now, I say that it's important to say that back in the 1990s, when the Taliban were previously in power, they pursued an Islamic uh, universalist and also in some way isolationist policy, um, seeking to preserve Afghanistan and to some extent isolate it from the rest of the world. So for Afghanistan, a uh, Taliban-led Afghanistan to enter the Shanghai Cooperation Organization would be a radical change. But I said previously that the Taliban wants also a peaceful, stable Afghanistan, one ultimately fully under control of whatever government is eventually established in Afghanistan and led by themselves. And the only way to achieve that is to integrate Afghanistan into institutions which will eventually allow for Afghanistan's economic growth. And that, of course, is a major imperative, especially if the Taliban are to achieve the objective of eradicating drug production in the country. And indeed, we already hear stories about how the Chinese want to build railway links and road links through Afghanistan, or at least repair the roads in Afghanistan, which, by the way, it was the Soviets who built, built in the 1950s and 1960s, how the uh, uh, Chinese want to re-establish all of that and build their railways and their pipelines and the infrastructure that they want to see established in Afghanistan. And ultimately, the Taliban will want to be part of that because they will want to provide the Afghan people with a future which will make them ultimately more accepting of Taliban rule. So it's not impossible, I would say actually, that it is highly likely that this objective of getting the Taliban to recommit to the commitments that the present Afghan government is making for Afghanistan to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it's quite likely that that will be achieved also. Anyway, there we are, a very complex and very difficult set of negotiations are 
going to be underway over the next few weeks and months. As I said, I expect, I'm, I, I think it is highly likely that towards the end of Ju July, the beginning of August, we will see negotiations, probably mediated or brokered by the Russians in some form, for a peaceful transfer of power with the uh, Taliban occupying Kabul peacefully and peacefully taking control there and establishing themselves as the government of the country with further negotiations to establish a broad-based government which will take into account the opinions and feelings of all of the people of Afghanistan, including the various communities that make up the country. We could see, finally, real peace in Afghanistan, a peace that has not been since the 1970s. And we could also start to see a Afghanistan which begins to integrate itself as an independent and sovereign state, not a vassal state, either of the Soviet Union or of the United States, but start to integrate itself with its neighbours in the greater Eurasia institutions that are gradually being built up. Well, all I can say is, I hope that this all happens. Um, it, it would be the end, of course, of the Afghan wars, if it were to happen, and it would be peace for the Afghan people. Perhaps what would be established would not be a democracy, a liberal democracy, such as some people in the United States and in the West, especially, by the way, in Britain, were talking about. But that was never achievable in a country like Afghanistan. It would finally provide the Afghan people with a political system which they perhaps can understand and relate to and work with in some way and which can establish peace in their country and which would enable them finally to see to achieve that economic reconstruction and development which they deserve. And it would also mean the end of these wars that have been fought on their territory and which ultimately have their origins not in the problems of Afghanistan itself, but in the rivalries of the great powers that their nation became a victim to. I think that would be a good outcome, and it is one I hope for. We shall see whether it comes to pass. Thank you for joining me in this long and detailed programme about this complex subject. I look forward to you joining me in future programmes on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou. Please don't forget to check out Alex's own channel. You will find links under this video. Please also check us out on our other platforms, BitChute, Library, SuperU, uh, uh, Locals and all the rest. And please also support us to the extent that you can via PayPal, Patreon and Subscribestar. And also by going to our shop and buying all the wonderful things that you will find there. Our amazing magic mugs, our hats, our t-shirts, our hoodies, our, our, our sweatshirts and all the rest. And if you like this programme, please remember to press the like button to this video. And also, please remember to check your subscription to this channel. And thank you for joining me today on this long and involved programme on this complex subject. And I look forward to you joining me again in future programmes and have a wonderful day until then.